So it's a it's an honor and a pleasure to to introduce uh, uh, the meeting in uh, honor of Jurgen Ren. We we know each other since the eighties, so and uh, it came as a sort of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, chance to to organize this meeting. Uh, we were uh, we were meeting for another reason, and at some point it came out that he was sixty five, and so I. I told him why we don't meet in Trieste for your 60th anniversary. And then, of course, the pandemic delayed the the the, the event, uh, and uh, so now you are 66. Congratulations and happy birthday! So I, I even put a German song uh, by Udo, Udo Jürgens that life begins at 66. So, uh, so a song that I knew. Uh, from uh, from our meetings, uh, so I must say that I enjoyed very much the uh, the meetings that we had online. That it created a sort of friendship that uh, among the uh, organizers. And uh, now that I see you all in presence, I'm uh, uh, very happy and uh, and uh, I hope that we will spend a very nice days together in uh, in Trieste. So just uh, as usual for those who don't know CISA, I will uh, read a uh, uh, text that I read, I read uh, always when we have, we had our, uh, we had a, a series of, uh, of seminars or webinars online of uh, five webinars. And uh, I hope they will be become accessible to everybody because it was, uh, I think uh, I, they were very interesting talks so that can be added to the program easily. So, and uh, during these webinars, I was reading a, a sort of text that uh, summarizes what is CISA. So I, I will uh, read it again, because I think uh, it's important that you know where you are. Okay, CISA is a PhD school and it was funded by in Trieste in 1978. And uh, in the first row, there is one, uh, the first real director of CISA, Daniele Amati. I'm very happy that he was able to come. Uh, and uh, CISA's mission is to carry out state-of-the-art research in physics, mathematics, and then neuroscience that, both, that uh, in fact, uh, Daniele introduced uh, at CISA. Uh, so we have lecture courses in um, these uh, three disciplines, uh, and uh, the size of the CISA has remained uh, um, modest. So we are an institution of modest dimension. There are about 73 professors and uh, under the 30 younger researchers and three, but we have a, a, quite a number of PhDs. So we have uh, 300 PhD students. And of course, our assistants that uh, uh, administrative staff that you, you have known here, Mila and Claudia are helping from, uh, from the lab. So I'm, I, uh, and I will take the opportunity also to thank Lina Schwabel for the fantastic work uh, she did uh, together with uh, with uh, <laughs> with our secretaries. So, so uh, we select students from everywhere, uh, selecting uh, let's say seventy students per year, more or less, and uh, one third of them is uh, comes from abroad. Uh, so, so it's an international school. Uh, all courses are given in English, and uh, there are numerous collaborations that I don't want to, to list with many international institutions. Uh, uh, so, and uh, about the quality of the school, I, I can say that the, the most recent news is that in the ranking of the government, we uh, turned out to be first. So it was good news. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, it was a, a, a play of numbers, you know, usually in these evaluations, I don't believe much in numerical evaluation, but okay, okay. It was a sort of good to see that in the slide that the government presented in the, in the national presentation of the level of the Italian university, CISA came out the first. Uh, okay, so we, I don't add more, and uh, so I I can leave the floor to Andrea Gambassi, who is the the director of the interdisciplinary lab at CISA, and he will say a few words about the interdisciplinary lab, and then the floor will go to the chairman of the first session, Benjamin Stein. Okay.
So good morning, everybody. Now, uh, as Stefano said, the CISA is primarily a doctoral school in physics, mathematics, and neuroscience. So what are we doing here? No, this is the natural question. And the answer is in the very inspiration of our founder, Professor Budinich, who, who uh, rightfully believed that there is a essential unity of knowledge. And this is the reason why a uh, few years after the foundation of CISA, he founded in CISA the Interdisciplinary Lab for Natural Science and Humanities, was aim is was uh, mission is uh, really to promote the dialogue between the hard sciences that we study in CISA and humanities in in all possible aspects. Uh, I mean, from from art to, to history to philosophy. So this is the reason why we are here, because it's part of the mission of our of the interdisciplinary lab that I have the honor to direct to to foster this kind of dialogue in order also to broaden the view of our PhD students, because we have fantastic and successful PhD students, really very focused, really brilliant, but sometimes I feel that they are too focused. So the idea is to try to offer them the possibility to enlarge their vision and to think also about the broader implications of what they are doing, which is essentially the spirit of this meeting, no? the evolution of knowledge where science Hard science is one ingredient in the big picture of knowledge. So the disciplinary lab therefore organizes uh, um, uh, uh, regularly these kind of meetings. And as Stefano said, we have this series of meetings in preparation of this one. We organize uh, public meetings in town uh, in order to, 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 to popularize science. And also we have a very strong activity in, um, we organize a festival about science and literature, Scienze Virgola. And we organize uh, since uh, 30 years, we have uh, the most successful, uh, actually at the European level, master in science communication, which was, uh, I mean, you know, 30 years ago. So we are talking about 30 years ago in the vision of our directors, including Daniela Mati, it's important that scientists must speak to the society and this must speak in the correct way because otherwise, and then, you know, the disaster of pandemics that we have seen. This said, I mean, um, I'm really pleased that we host, uh, uh, that we managed to host this meeting. It has been for us a bit of an effort. And for this, I would like to thank the local secretaries, Claudia and Mila, who did, uh, who are doing a fantastic effort. So I would uh, suggest to, because, uh, it, it has been uh, it has been uh, complicated, but we managed. I hope that you will enjoy. If something went wrong, the fault is mine, uh, as usual. And uh, I hope you will enjoy the the conference. And I hope that this conference will be uh, the seed for future collaboration in view of the mission of the lab that I have the pleasure to direct. This said, I would like to to again welcome you all in Trieste, which is a fantastic city, as we know. Probably will tell you also if you need some details about the history. And then I also would like to, to, to welcome the people online. And this said, I would like to give the, the floor to the first chairman of today. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's a, a great honor for me to open on this revolutionary date on 14 juillet, this uh, first session on the evolution of knowledge and just a few words from from my side and then i will hand over to our three speakers origin of uh of the evolution of knowledge is the the title of our session here and um the question of the origin is interesting in a methodological uh, sense of course uh, because you can always talk about um, different origins and then you, you come up with, with different answers, with different um, uh, scenarios, which internal structure um, interacts with which external uh, structure so that the evolutionary mechanism comes um, into place. And so what and where are these origins of the evolution of knowledge? We can ask this in historical, geographical, anthropological 
systemic respects with very different answers. In our session, we will he uh, hear about origins in quite different geographic, historic, systemic ways, touching upon some of the different paths Jürgen also has followed in his book and in his general work. One type of uh, the origin of evolution of knowledge is, of course, in cognitive structures. Also there, these, in some respect, are physiological structures, and, but they are not just given in a natural sense, but they are evolving in feedback loops between neurological, internal, and external, technological, cultural, social structures. We will hear about cognitive artifacts from Steve Levinson in a bit. In terms of the historiography of the sciences and in terms of the systemic hierarchies of the academic uh, disciplines, the history of mathemat mathematics is of course fundamental. And we will hear from Professor Jens Hörrop, a specialist about the oldest origins of Babylonian uh, mathematics today, about uh, mathematics in the European 17th century. Another very different type of origin of knowledge is in the various types of practical craftsmanship. Here, the history of metallurgy is, of course, one of the most famous cases, one of the famous, most famous fields for the whole history um, and evolution of knowledge. We will hear from Professor Liu about this. So these already were my opening remarks, and I now uh, hand over to uh, Professor uh, Steve Levinson. I will introduce him a little bit, maybe most or some of you um, know him already very well, but I still say a few sentences. Steve is since uh, 2017 Director Emeritus at the Max Planck Institute for, the, for uh, Psycholinguistics in Nijmegen in the Netherlands, which he was actively directing from 1994 until um, 2017. He earned his first academic degrees in archaeology and social anthropology in Cambridge and finished his PhD in linguistic anthropology in Berkeley. His research focuses, as he wrote, writes himself, on language diversity and its implications for theories on human cognition. Language is the only animal communication system that differs radically in form and meaning across social groups of the same species, in fact, that has been neglected in the cognitive sciences. His work attempts both to grasp, grasp what this diversity is all about and to exploit it as a way of discovering the role that language plays in our everyday cognition. He held and holds many academic and honorary positions around various countries, such as the Donders Institute for Brain, Cognition and Behavior, in the Radboud University in Mechen, at the University of Cambridge, at the Australian National University, and at Stanford. He's a member uh, of many advisory boards in the UK, in the Netherlands, France, Germany, and is fellow of the British Academy and author of many, many books. 300 publications, including papers in science, nature, proceedings of the National Academy of Science, etc., etc. It was in Berlin when he was running a project on cognitive anthropology in 1989 until 91, where he met Jürgen Renn. They had many overlapping interests in early literacy and spatial cognition, and as Steve tells, they might have worked closely together had not the fate sent him to the Netherlands where he worked primarily on language and cognition. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for that nice introduction. Um, it is really a great pleasure to, uh, is it clear? Can, the sound is clear? Good. Uh, to, uh, to be here and to give this talk on uh, the occasion of Jürgen's coming of age. <laughs> and, um, uh, and of course, we're celebrating many things, the book uh, uh, primarily, but also uh, his uh, recent uh, honorary PhD uh, and, um, and, and his recent apotheosis uh, as the director of a new Max Planck Institute uh, for geoanthropology. So these remarks come from the real earthly, down to earth, 
anthropologists. Uh, and perhaps, um, you know, I, I hope they're going to be of some use to you. I'm not a historian of science. And what I say may be totally self-evident to all of you. Uh, I hope not, but we'll find out. So uh, without more ado then, uh, let me come to the topic. So I'm going to riff on this uh, statement of Jürgen's from the book. All this hints at the role of material culture as the backbone of an evolution of knowledge. What if the game-changing role of material culture as a means of cognition also extends to the symbolic means of our thinking. And uh, I, I, I want to suggest that Jürgen might have really put his finger here on one of the great engines of knowledge production. And I want to explore that there might have been a sort of single human trick that was critical uh, in starting the knowledge spiral. Uh, and the thesis I'm going to outline is just the idea, which is actually Jack Goody's idea, anthropologist Jack Goody, um, who, uh, who talked about technology as the intellect. I'm going to use the term cognitive artifact because I want to, uh, uh, to uh, sort of itemize things. Uh, um, I'm going to argue that cognitive artifacts have played this critical role. And I'll argue this is partly because cognitive artifacts are actually a much broader class than we normally think of. And secondly, and most importantly, because of the mechanism behind them. Uh, and I'll try to sketch uh, how these cognitive artifacts work as sort of thought transducers. So I'm going to approach this from a sort of evolutionary perspective. Um, and, uh, and, I, and then the question I suppose is, you know, how did the species ever become knowledge producers and consumers in the first place? Uh, perhaps this is not a distinct question from what advantage did culture and language offer to the species? Uh, there the answer I feel is fairly clear, tools. Uh, both material and abstract. Uh, and, you know, what's a tool? Well, it's some kind of a prosthetic device. Uh, it's a force amplifier in the simple case. Uh, there are, are a bunch of force amplifiers, and what do they do? They amplify the body. But there's a whole different class of artifacts that I'm going to call cognitive artifacts that basically amplify the mind. Um, and, the, and now I'm into, squarely into your territory, the history of science. So we have number, if you're thinking about the domain of number, all of the uh, uh, computational devices and aids that people have devised, including, of course, number notations of various sorts. And if you think about time, uh, then we have uh, all of the means of reckoning diurnal time and then calendrical time and the devices uh, involved in, in reckoning, in, in, in conceiving uh, um, uh, correctly, you know, uh, uh, astronomical time and so on. If you think about space, then we have, uh, in the simplest case, verbal itineraries like the song lines of the Australians, uh, through to maps, wayfinding techniques, compasses, astrolabes, and so on. So th this, this is all your territory, not really mine, um, but uh, I just mentioned it so you have sort of clear idea of the domains that we're talking about, cognitive artifacts. So what I want to draw attention to is the very special ontology uh, of cognitive artifacts. And um, as recognized, I think, by Durkheim, uh, when he emphasized that social facts are psychological, but not reducible to psychology. Uh, so here's a simple kind of diagram for cognitive artifacts. What, do you, what are they used for? Well, you're in the middle of some mental computation. You issue a query. <laughs> you come up with, with a problem of some kind. You issue a query to your instrument. The instrument uh, gives you a response. Uh, and, uh, and this I want to claim is some kind of a coupled system. It's both inside and outside the head. Uh, and, uh, and this is of course, a solution to Durkheim's ontological problem. Um, and it also uh, has this critical property that be, because it's external, partly external, it can be subject to the uh, forces of cultural evolution, to the process of, of improvements over time, over generations. So this theory here is uh, more or less the same as that advanced by Andy Clark, um, a philosopher, uh, um, in using the term extended mind, which actually not referenced, I think, by Jürgen, uh, but very interesting uh, series of books. And I think it parallels the extended phenotype and niche construction ideas that Manfred uh, Laubeck, Pickler, and, and Jürgen have developed uh, in, in recent years. So now I want to 
make it clear I'm interested, uh, or at least I think at the start, and partly for expositional reasons, in the very simplest kind of cognitive artifact. Uh, because I think, you know, you guys, uh, historians of science, can think of uh, fancy machines. But I'm thinking about the very simplest things that are all around us that we use to help us think. So here's a gentleman, he's a uh, Mayan, uh, Delta speaking Indian in Chiapas, uh, in Mexico. And all, uh, all of these uh, men carry with them a stick, which of course has various functions, but the primary function, and it's a standardized uh, measure, uh, is for uh, planting. So he sticks this stick in the ground, he makes a little mound, sticks this three times in the ground, plants one seed in each mound, and he uses the stick to, to, uh, to measure where the next little mound should be, and similarly right across uh, the row, and then he'll use the stick to get, make sure the rows are equidistant, and so on. Terribly simple, but why is it important? Well, uh, you end up with a very nice uh, organized field, uh, but you know exactly how much you've planted. You know what the likely yield is. You can calculate by <laughs> multiplying uh, rows and multiplying you know, all of the little mounds by three, and then you, you've got uh, uh, three plants in each there, and you know that each plant has two cobs, and now you've got a, uh, an estimate of what your granary should look like at the end of the year. Tremendously important if you're a farm worker. So that's the kind of thing that I want to just draw your attention to. Simple things uh, can be uh, cognitive artifacts. And of course, all the traditional weights and measures have played a similar role in other cultures. So an English acre was the amount of land an ox could plow in a day, um, and so on and so forth. So uh, measures play a crucial role in market economies. So what happens when we look at a society that is outside a market economy? Let's go to an island in the Pacific, uh, isolated place called Russell Island, at the end of the Louisiana archipelago in uh, Papua New Guinea. But um, uh, here you see uh, they are making a canoe. And you can see that, um, uh, let me do this, um, trying to get the point to the point, but it's not working. Anyway, um, uh, but you can see at the end of the canoe, behind the man with numbered six, there are some sticks sticking out. That's because in order to make the constructions, these people, Russell Islanders, they basically uh, do everything by eye, and then they're just gonna chop off the, sur the surplus, as it were. Uh, so everything, there's no measurement. And, and you can see here, the same goes for a house uh, uh, that's being constructed here. Um, so uh, it, they, it, it, it's a bit surprising because they'll trot, trot up, up the top of a, a thousand meter mountain, cut down a, a huge tree to, for a ridge pole, carry this thing right down to the bottom of the mountain, uh, put it up there, and then chop off a third. <laughs> it's like a heavy, great thing, 500 kilos or so. Uh, and, um, and, and I think it's just uh, uh, obviously it is costly in terms of materials and labor, but they are not short of either. Uh, and, and so uh, um, this is a sort of phenomenon in societies that uh, are outside market economies. So now I wanted to just say a few words about cultural evolution. <laughs> uh, as we mentioned, so if you have this instrument uh, in this coupled system, the, the instrument is external, so it can be worked on by cultural evolution. And so you can have, for example, this great progression uh, in temporal uh, reckoning uh, um, uh, across the ages from sundials to quartz clocks through different kinds of escapements and so on again. This is your domain. Uh, but I want to point out my domain, language. Um, um, it's very interesting if you think about um, cultural evolution because curiously, uh, you can apply all of the standard techniques from bioinformatics directly to language material and get out sensible effects. So perfect trees that you can, in this case, the, I, I'm showing you the trees for Austronesian languages, about a thousand Austronesian languages, um, and, uh, and you can do trees for different aspects of the language, for the grammar, for the lexicon, and so on. Um, and so it, the, the, the underlying uh, reason that this works so well, you can check, even you can do sort of dating from it, um, uh, and the underlying reason it works so well is basically language uh, has a lot of the same uh, properties as biological evolution, you know, with selection, drift, founder effects, hybridization, and so on. It's a bit more obviously like bacteria or a plant than 
mammalian <laughs> uh, evolution because you know there's a lot of lateral transfer. And you can also see the kind of slow, steady optimization um, uh, uh, as, as in the fact that frequent words get uh, shorter. So now the, my question to you is, could knowledge evolution be put on a similar footing? Uh, and I think to some extent it obviously could, uh, you know, in little domains like you, know, you want to work on balances, for example, I can see that being entirely possible to do that. Uh, I just don't know whether it's fully possible. And one of the reasons why um, it might not be so easy is that technology is a little bit more unpredictable. Uh, and that's partly because of this rapid hybridization. So Russell Island, which is, that was the place without a market economy we just looked at, um, you know, it, what happens there is things wash up. It's on the end, it's the end of an archipelago. So it, uh, it gets a lot of flotsam and jetsam. And, uh, and they'll, they'll find a canoe that's washed up from the Solomons or somewhere. And they think, hey, this is a better design. Okay, let's just copy this. <laughs> so we get this uh, sort of lateral uh, uh, hybridization very rapidly. You also got this interesting interaction between demography uh, and technology. So technology is often lost in very small uh, uh, societies. So loss of fire making in Tasmania, for example. Um, uh, and then there've been long periods of stasis. Uh, famous, of course, is the Shirley on hand axe, which may more or less similar over a million years. Uh, but even just if you look at there, uh, there's uh, the sculptor's mallets, uh, one from about 3000 BC from, from uh, Egypt and, uh, and a modern one there. So there are many uh, interesting kind of uh, uh, pulses <laughs> uh, that one would need to take into account. And I think that what's especially problematic is the fact that cognitive technology is very fragile. It's very fragile because it's this coupled system relying on both on the internal uh, uh, mental agility and, and practice and these external devices. And so you've we've had all of these collapses of, uh, of literacy, astronomy, and so on uh, in the Mayan case or late Bronze Ages, Europe or Dark Ages uh, later. So let me now just try to say something about, uh, you know, some kind of definition of, uh, of cognitive artifacts or at least some characterization. That's what I'm going to offer you. And it's very loose and simple. So here, a cognitive artifact's got the following kind of properties. Um, there's some kind of a cognitive problem that it solves. Um, uh, and, and in the simplest case, let's just think about tape measure. You know, so you want to you want to measure a, a gap for a door. Uh, and, uh, and so that's the question you're asking. And, and the artifact is externalized in the public accessible medium, like tape measure. Um, and, and because it's externalized, you know, it's got a, it's a neat thing that pulls out a, a thin metal band and it's in standardized units. Uh, um, and there's a procedure for operating on this. Uh, so you hold the, the, the tape against the gap. Uh, the process is economical. The cognitive out, uh, advantage outweighs it's the cost of externalization, uh, which would just be sort of uh, like the Russell Island, just a visual guess at the, at the size. Um, and, and the output of the process has got to be easily re-assimilated. Uh, for example, and easy to remember the number of centimeters. For example. So that's the sort of rough characterization of what we're talking about. Now, there are different kinds of, uh, of cognitive artifacts. There's th that kind, which is a computational kind. And then there's the mnemonic kind, which aids long-term recall. And this is from tallies to calendars and so on, and indeed writing. <laughs> um, so it, it's basically the same thing. It's, it's again, um, an aid to internal computation. Now you've hit a problem, and now it's of look using an instrument to do a new computation. You're just trying to find the old fact out of your aid memoir. Um, and of course, the kipu uh, uh, from ancient Peru are the most, perhaps the most elaborate of these kind of uh, non literary uh, mnemonics. Um, and indeed, uh, the history of, of our own writing system may lie, it, it have its origins in tallies as. Uh, Peter Damaral and Jürgen worked on so many years ago, and it was fascinating stuff that it, you, you, you would have been amazed about the enthusiasm of those two <laughs> that you witnessed them together. Uh, anyway, uh, I, uh, so here's a sort of rough characterization. This is perfect, obvious, you know, uh, uh, of, 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 of cognitive artifacts. The goal is to reproduce the thought at a later time. It's got to be an external associate of the thought. Uh, which is going to be accessible at that later time and then for random others to retrieve the thought there's got to be a system of some kind of convention 
uh, and the precision, the procedure's got to be economical and it's got, and the result has got to be decipherable when you got hold of the external artifact, you've got to be able to recover the thought. So there's a, there's just a rough characterization. And of course, there's a huge range of contemporary mnemonic artifacts. This is a pilot's um, checklist, uh, in a flip chart uh, before takeoff. Uh, and then of course, all the vast repositories of information where retrieval uh, becomes the central problem uh, without which no science, history, law, uh, or any of the things <laughs> that we do. <laughs> So, um, so summary so far, cognitive artifacts, an object whose main function is to aid mental operations, typically shaped by cultural transmission, together with the operator, the person, it forms a coupled system which changes the nature and efficiency of the mental operations. But let's just see why such a coupled system has such efficacy. So, um, in order to explore coupled systems, let me go back to Jack Goody's work on literacy. So uh, as he pointed out, it's obviously a revolutionary technology. It allowed communication over distance. It allows communication over time. It allowed us to recover the, the, um, the, the, the uh, sequence of, of, of Halley's Comet. Um, but it's the point that uh, Jack Goody wanted to make is it's mind changing. It changes the way you operate. And it's because of the metacognition that's afforded by uh, writing. You can inspect what you've written, of course. This is how we all find out how, you know, what we, what we uh, really think is who we write it out. And, and, uh, but, um, uh, and it's by virtue of the inspection of lists and tables, look at the periodic table or, um, or, and all of the other uh, uh, devices like the, being able to think about uh, uh, language, you being able to devise logics and so on. Now, what uh, Jack Goody didn't know, what the data wasn't available in his day, uh, is that uh, literacy actually rewires the brain. So uh, here's uh, work by um, Dan Dahana, uh, Stan Dahana. Um, uh, and I just want to draw your attention to this visual word form area. I'm sorry, my pointer doesn't seem to be working. It's pretty, but um, uh, does this work? Yeah, this, it's here. Uh, this visual word form area at the bottom of the brain here um, uh, is where the uh, information from the two eyes is shunted. Um, and and, it, um, uh, and what there is, is an anatomical uh, signature of literacy. You can see it for one thing, because it, they've got the, the, the two eyes are gonna shunt this information through to the left hemisphere, where obviously language is, is situated, um, the corpus callosum thickens. And there's similar other details of the wiring that actually change. But in addition, there's actually additional gray matter. Uh, you can see it here at the bottom here. Um, uh, uh, the, the, in the parietal area, uh, you've got additional gray matter building up uh, in, in amongst literates. So this is what uh, 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 is quite typical, I think, probably of cognitive artifacts. We don't have a you know, huge amount of data about other use of other cognitive, but it is also true, for example, for users of, uh, of, uh, of the abacus. So here is the point. Coupled systems involve a mutual adaptation of brain to the, uh, to the uh, cultural artifact. So the cultural artifact, this is Standard Hanna's point, the cultural artifact, so here you can see these kind of spidery uh, little figures that are the letters that we all use. But these, uh, that's to say, these are the successful writing systems. There were some obviously restricted to priestly castes and so on, like the ancient Mayan uh, system, but but the successful mass uh, writing systems all have this spidery sort of little thin line character. Um, and that's because it's adapted to the part of the brain, the fusiform gyrus, which is pre-adapted uh, for just this kind of thing. So that's what we mean by a couple of system, both parts gradually uh, um, uh, merging. So now, um, I'd wanted to also talk about our own communication system, both language and gesture because George Miller, the founding father of cognitive science, if there is a single one, um, uh, he said the kind of linguistic recoding that people do seems to be the very lifeblood of the thought processes. This is the role of language in cognition. And he said that he, he pointed out that the short-term memory bottleneck is the reason 
because we can only hold about four items in working memory at once. So we have this, this buffer, this, this bottleneck uh, in our working memory system, which is very restricted for the number of items it can hold. It's not restricted for the complexities of those items. So you could think about this as four pointers uh, to long-term memory. So you can have other, you can have quite complex ideas, but they've got to have a, only four pointers at a time in your head. And that's why, of course, we chunk telephone numbers into parts. Um, and, and words, uh, obviously, what do they do? They express complex concepts into handy chunks using long-term memory to get, get over this short-term memory bottleneck. And that's why we use acronyms, we have scientific terminology, you don't have to explain logarithm in detail every time you use the word. Um, and, and so this is a fundamental uh, um, way in which our languages are protocol providers of cognitive tools. Now, um, so here, just to uh, sort of visually do this again, so you've got this culturally external language that's external, so you, it can be uh, honed by uh, cultural evolution, and therefore you get locally useful concepts. Um, and then, of course, the, uh, those concepts can squeeze through the working memory bottleneck, uh, and the local language is going to retool the way you think. Um, as an example of this, let me take you to uh, uh, Northern Australia, uh, where the Aboriginal uh, groups uh, speak a language called Gugu Yemitja. Uh, these people use North, House, North, South, East, West system exclusively. They do not have any words for left, right, front, back, and so on. They don't use an egocentric uh, coordinate system at all in the language. Um, and as a result of this, uh, one in 10 words is a directional uh, word, one of these North, South, East, West words with a gesture. Uh, the gesture is important because it adds analog precision to what would otherwise be a coarse sort of 90 degree arc. Um, and, uh, and because the, this is the way the language works, these people, obviously in order to speak this language, you have to be uh, oriented the whole time. And as a result, uh, they are formidable um, uh, mental compass. They have formidable mental compasses. Uh, and I've measured this and it's, uh, you can, you know, you displace people at night and get them to point to various places and so on. Uh, and it's just extraordinary, actually, uh, uh, the, the, the facility. And it's, 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 of course, a lifetime of practice <laughs> with a language system that forces you <laughs> to be precise. And so this is a Dutch sample for comparison. Now, um, so the system's got profound effects on memory and inference as well as, as, well as wayfinding. So, and I just want to mention that gesture, we think, people tend not to think about gesture, it's tremendously important uh, it, it, as one of our little externalizers. Uh, so if you just think about counting on the fingers, here's a New Guinea counting system. Uh, but, uh, and it's very interesting work by Susan Golden Meadow that shows that children actually, uh, um, when they're doing Piagetian tasks, for example, first have the right answer in their gestures uh, and the wrong answer <laughs> spoken, but uh, later come to that. But, uh, somewhere you, you use gestures, just imagine yourself giving root direction to somewhere, you use gestures to feel out <laughs> quite literally, you know, uh, um, uh, what you want to say. So now all of this might seem quite limited, I think, um, uh, but I, I think there are many extensions to, to cognitive artifacts that uh, perhaps we just need to point out. First of all, you can, um, uh, obviously uh, use perceptual prostheses of various kinds. If you just think of a blind man's stick, <laughs> uh, um, uh, that's an example, but also the telescope, uh, the microscope and so on, this is all again in your domain, but it, of course this is turning out to be very interesting from the point of wearable technology. Uh, so I, I know somebody who's actually in inventing a belt that will, um, uh, uh, as you turn around, continue to point to north, it will, it will tickle your, your tummy, <laughs> so, uh, so it's an artificial uh, Google Imager system, as it were. So anyway, there, there's obviously sort of a, a whole bunch of interesting things going on there. But another possible extension, if you're thinking about cognitive artifacts, is to think about human teams <laughs> uh, uh, as uh, computational devices. So Ed Hutchins, anthropologist, uh, studied that the, that the, um, uh, the, the, the navigation team on a modern warship 
and saw how all of the different uh, devices that he used, depth sounders, radar, uh, GPS, and so on, all of this has to be sort of funneled into some central decision maker. Uh, and so there are all of these specialists reading the gear uh, and, um, and, uh, and feeding it through to the captain who then, you know, devises the course for the ship. So, uh, so uh, what is a bureaucracy? But a computational device for the state. And of course, then you think about scientific teams uh, and so on. So I think these are interesting extensions. Uh, you can even go on and think about the technologies of emotion manipulation. If you think about emotion as part of cognition, um, it's a little bit different domain, of course, but mind changing substances, various perceptual uh, stimulation things that we've devised like music, dance, and so on and so forth. So all of this uh, kind of fits into this same uh, sort of scheme. But now you, I, I did promise this, I want to say something about how these things might actually work. You know, it's not totally obvious why externalizing something helps you think. At least uh, it may be in the case of uh, complex instruments, but for the simple ones, it's not, I think. So let me just say something about this. I'm going to suggest that cognitive artifacts work as sort of thought transducers. And one of the reasons is simply that we have Two, they give us two representations, we get double representation. So if you think about the gesture, you know, accompanying the thought, you have a, a double representation, the language <laughs> thought and then the, uh, the gestural thought. And they, these kind of things give you sort of extra handles uh, for computation or retrieval. Then you have, of course, the temporal freezing that's afforded, affords meta-analysis when you're talking about writing, music, seismographs, whatever, you know, some output a frozen output. Um, and then you have the transductions into different dimensionality. So uh, uh, you think about uh, the terrain being reduced to a 2D map, for example. Um, uh, and you could think about time uh, being instantiated in 3D objects and so on and so forth. We've got this dimension play um, playing around. Uh, and then you can think about the way in which externalization allows stronger modalities to reinforce weaker ones. And so the visual representation of abstract properties in geometry with graphs, uh, Venn diagrams, and so on. And, um, but most importantly, perhaps most essentially, you know, externalization overcomes this short-term memory bottleneck. You can out ship this uh, problem of, uh, of you can only have four things in your head at once. Um, and uh, and it, here the, it, it's worth knowing that there's both a visual and a phonological buffer in your head. So there's both a, um, a visual memory and a sort of internal sound memory. So if, you do, if you're rehearsing the telephone number to yourself, you're using the internal sound memory. Uh, but the, so, so that gives you some reason for seeing like how the uh, added um, dimensions or uh, added uh, uh, modalities can be very uh, important. Um, another thing is that external representations tend to simplify. Uh, they just select a few dominant features of the underlying thoughts, um, uh, as with maps, uh, gestures, diagrams, even uh, written languages, and uh, uh, you know, kind of approximation to the <laughs> spoken form. Um, an additional thing that they do by virtue of being external is they actually constrain physically the computational space, <laughs> uh, which it might be pretty important in some cases. Um, and, and then, as I've mentioned, you know, the point is that by being, virtue of being externalized, they, these things can be honed by, cult by cultural evolution to maximize the metacognitive handles and minimize, minimize the efforts of transduction. Uh, above all, though, I think it's the recursive externalization and re-ingestion that bring the inner and outer formats closer in alignment, and that's, e that's what eases the, uh, the difficulty of transduction, so it makes these instruments easier to use on frequent use, and it leads to these brain adaptations uh, that we saw. So here, I think, just in uh, diagrammatic form, um, those, uh, you can see the the, the sort of benefits uh, listed here, and then uh, and uh, and then we have this uh, because of this internalization, uh, external, you know, this ingestion and re re export and so on. This repeated process, we get this mental alignment uh, of the insides with the outsides. So let me conclude. Um, 
Uh, so I'm trying to claim, you know, cognitive artifacts might be really be the engine of knowledge uh, evolution. And the power resides in the special ontologies of coupled systems that bridge brain and material objects. Um, the fact then that the external artifacts can get honed by cultural evolution, that re-ingestion um, engenders changes in thought patterns and brain transformation. And these internal changes avoid uh, afford stepping up levels of abstraction. So you can think about how chunking, um, uh, which allows us to get over the um, this, uh, this short-term memory bottleneck, how this allows representations of representations because of just indexing uh, things uh, in long-term memory. The internal changes afford more in turn afford more complex external devices. So as you get more you well, able to use the device, of course, you can use more and more complicated devices. And so you get this upward spiral of calculation and abstraction that takes off. Um, and I think this is, you know, the evolutionary advantages of shared externalized cognition are explained by this sort of uh, set of, of explanations. So that's some answer, I hope, to how we may have become knowledge producers and consumers. And now I have drawn, in cobbling this account together, I've drawn on um, a literature that um, may not be known to you. <laughs> so I'm just gonna uh, leave this slide up uh, here, um, just to point out that there's a, it's a large body of thought in anthropology, um, situation cognition, distributed cognition, in ethno-archeology, span um, in the anthropology of things, uh, people like myself, linguistic relativists, uh, who think about language as, as being a sort of cognitive tool, uh, and then these philosophers um, uh, uh, and, the, and the psychologists. Uh, interestingly, the, the, the psychologists in some design have a lot to say, I think, about this too. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, would, would you not, not stay here maybe for some additional questions? So my, my sense of time tells me that we uh, maybe we'll keep also to the to the general uh, discussion uh, moderated by, by Sven, but maybe if some short questions are already here. Yes. So sorry, as a physicist, I have a concern about the time scales, because you said clearly that the, the, I mean, the artifacts is a coupled system of something internal and something external. On the other hand, I would expect that what is external can be evolved on a time scale which is much faster than what is internal, because the, I mean. You said that uh, uh, re, um, language re, re, rewrites your brain, literacy rewrites your brain. That's fine, but this happens on a much longer time scale than what I can act in modifying my external representation. So I was a bit worried about this mismatch of time scales. It's not that I change, yeah. if I change my artifact immediately, my mind is changing, you know? I don't know if I'm clear. I'm not sure I fully understand the problem, but I mean, clearly, uh, you know, cultural evolution works on a, a generational time scale, if that's what you're uh, saying, I, or it may. Sometimes, of course, like with modern technology, it's roaring ahead, <laughs> but um, uh, at a time that leaves uh, the, the, some of us behind. But, uh, but, um, but the I think the point about the what it does to your insides, your <laughs> your brain, as it were, has to do with the number of times that you use these devices and the way the more facility you build in using them. So this is something that takes place. I don't think we have the data for how long it takes you. Actually, it's pro I'm probably wrong. But I was going to say how long it takes you to to kind of induce these brain changes. Uh, the data that would uh, there are some people who have studied uh, Bacchus users, um, and there is some information about children. I don't know whether actually the brain imaging has been done, but, there, but that would be a place to look. You know, I, I, I know that children uh, can rapidly do so, use this, do uh, Bacchus calculations mentally <laughs> without the device, because that's one of the effects uh, of using these devices. You can actually be able to imagine the result. Uh, that the actual instrument would do. So uh, I suspect that you could uh, show that this happens, you know, uh, 
relatively fast, these brain adaptations, but I honestly don't know. Thanks, Stephen. Wonderful talk, but sort of following up on the previous question. So we have all those cognitive devices that allow us to build up incredible edifices of knowledge. And then we have a bottleneck, as you pointed out. And that bottleneck is also relevant for decision-making in the currently complex world. So in a way, what you sketched is sort of the conundrum. How do we ever get as a society in a democratic way, people to, who suffer that bottleneck to comprehend the complexities of knowledge system and make decisions if there is a competition for simplistic answers in the current political environment? It's a very good question, Manfred, but it's a problem for the new Institute of Geoanthropology. <laughs> it's not a problem that I have an answer to, I'm afraid, but, it, but it's true. I mean, it, it, it's very important to see that you know, there are distinct human limitations. Uh, and a lot of the devices that we have devised are, of course, there to overcome these uh, very distinct uh, uh, human, human limitations. But unfortunately, there are so, you know, ultimately, they're still there, the limitations. So I can't escape them. So then, then let's, let's hand over to Jens. Um, Jens Heirop studied physics and mathematics in Copenhagen and Paris. He was teaching regularly at the University of Roskilde, Denmark, further professorships and academic memberships in Leipzig, Rennes, but also Beijing. He describes himself as a runaway physicist who started with work in critical didactics and mathematics and SDS interest while he was teaching physics to future building engineers in the early 1970s and after a rambling walk ended up as a kind of historian of science and mathematics. His research focus is especially the history of mathematics in pre and early modern cultures, emphasizing Babylonia and the pre-modern practitioners traditions in their interaction with Babylonian, ancient Greeks and medieval Islamic, Latin and Roman vernacular cultures. In recent years, the Italian abacus tradition and its Arabic background. Babylonian mathematics, one of the most prominent origins, if you will, of the evolution of knowledge plays a key role in his work. The conundrum why the Babylonians would teach second degree equations while having no practical application drove him, as he wrote to me, towards studies in the sociology of Mesopotamian mathematical knowledge. And that was what, by a colleague who also knew Peter Damaro for his didactic stu studies, put him in contact with Peter Damaro around 1978. So in fact, Jens was already in contact with what became Jürgen's crew at Department One way before it was founded. At the very beginning at the, of the MPI for the history of science in 1994 um, to 95, he was invited for a six months institute, for a six month stay there, and he was often back for shorter stays. Floor is yours. Thank you. I hate speaking with microphone because it makes me speak too fast. I'll try to fight that. So, in the Discours Preliminaire to L'Encyclopédie from 1751, Jean Laurent d'Alembert writes as follows I translate. Finally, Newton arrived for whom Huygens had prepared the road, giving to philosophy a shape that it seems she will keep. This great genius saw it was time to ban from physics conjectures and vague hypotheses, or at least not to take them for more than they were worth, and that this science should be submitted to nothing but the experiences of geometry. Experiences, of course, has to rent of experience, and that would also be experiment. The, there's an echo on Nicolas Boileau's Enfin Malherbe Vin. And this gives extra weight to the praise of Newton as a definitive culmination of the scientific revolution. That Lambert knew his belle lettre just as, his, in, uh, as well as he knew his mathematics. 
And naive reading might further find a specific reference to Newton's use of geometric proofs in the Principia in contrast to the application of infinitesimal calculus, but that is over and naive. Infinitesimal analysis was perfectly at home in the class de geometry of the Académie des Sciences as it was in D'Alembert's own writings. So D'Alembert does to Newton what Newton had uh, does to Newton what Paulo had done to Malherbe. He takes a possession of him for his own century. And in 1751, when D'Alembert was writing this, the permanent shape of natural philosophy brought about by Newton was expressed in the new infinitesimal calculus. That miscellaneous infinitesimal considerations, mostly geometric, which we find in the 17th century gave rise to infinitesimal anal analysis, was conditioned by the preceding creation of the new algebraic analysis, the new algebra of Viet and Descartes. And my topic here will be the complex process from which emerged the first algebraic level of the new analysis of the 17th century. If you have read standard histories of mathematics, you will ask, complex process? Isn't it quite simple? Algorithmic created algebra in the 820s, Abokamel refined it, Fibonacci reordered it in Latin in 1202 or 1228, it survived with little change and no progress for three centuries. Then Girolamo Cardano, in some nasty interaction with Nicola Tartaglia, brought it to a new level, inspiring François Viet and René Descartes. That is the standard story. I could give references to very good scholars who tell that story. Standard stories are not necessarily known, but this one is. Algebra was received in Catholic Europe through three channels, efficiently at most through two. First of the two efficient channels uh, was Gerard of Cremona's translation of uh, Algorithmic Algebra made in Toledo around seven, uh, 1170. It didn't circulate much. There was no really space for it in university uh, learning, but it did circulate modestly. 15 manuscripts survived, so there must have been more. Another translation was prepared by Robert of Chester. We know it from three 15th century manuscripts produced in southern Germany. Its particular terminology has left no traces whatsoever, so nobody was inspired. It was only copied a few times. The Liber Mahamelet, the Liber Algorithmi, and Guglielm de Lunis were equally ineffectual. Those who are interested in these can ask me in the coffee break. In 1202, then, Fibonacci wrote a first version of the Liber Abaci in the last chapter which an algebra is contained. A revised version was made in 1200, uh, around 1228. The basic introduction was probably uh, uh, produced independently by Fibonacci under inspiration from Gerald's translation. The illustrating problems were borrowed from many, uh, from many sources, rather eclectically, and not ordered. Fibonacci's uh, algebra survived as part of the larger treatise. Its impact, however, was negligible. Jean de Mure drew on it as one of several sources for his algebraic books of his uh, Quatripartitum Numerorum, which was not very influential in the mid 14th century. And it was partially copied by Benedetto de Firenze and a few others in the mid 15th century, but without affecting their own algebraic work. So that was not an uh, efficient uh, import. The essential reception happened through a handful of abacus masters in the four, early 14th century. Abacus masters were masters of the school which taught uh, kids, uh, uh, merchants and, uh, and artisan sons for uh, a year and a half or two years around the 11, taught them uh, Hindu Arabic, Arabic numerals and commercial arithmetic. Compared with Abu Kamil, now the, uh, the immediate source area must have been Romance speaking and located somewhere in the Ibero provincial area. We know no more about it. Compared with Abu Kamil, the level is modest. There are no geometric proofs, 
uh, rules are given for the six basic. Oh, let's keep. That gives me more echo. <laughs> uh, rules are given for the six basic first and second degree cases, that is, uh, equation types. And for those cases, the third and fourth degree, that can be reduced to these or solved by means of a simple root extraction. Soon, however, false rules were also offered for such higher degree cases that cannot be solved in these ways. They were not easily exposed because the proposed solutions contained radicals that were never approximated. They might therefore be useful in competitions for positions in uh, Arabic schools paid by the city communes and competition for students uh, for private teachers. Apricot teaching was a liberal process, profession, and as we know, in a liberal profession, anything goes if it goes. Or the IKEA excuse, we shall never do it again before it happens next time. There were some mathematically better developments. Very soon after the import, we see incipient use of abbreviations for the algebraic powers serving also in formal calculations, that is uh, calculations with uh, algebraic expressions, which seem to uh, concern a normal fractions are governed by the, uh, the rules for that. You see an example here where the, the row stands for the thing, the, the first degree, the unknown, main or for, um, may for main, et cetera. Very similar notations have been created in the Maghreb in the outgoing 12th century. So it is, seems almost certain that the idea was borrowed. Now for more reason for that, uh, we showed the interactions. But the Italian understanding was apparently limited. Some abacus uh, writers used abbreviations in a way that effectively barred their service in symbolic calculations. And nobody used them systematically, you know, at least not before the outgoing 15th century. By then, Luca Pacioli still summed up the situation in the words, tot capita tot sensus, as many heads, so many opinions. That's not very productive for the externalization of, uh, or external production knowledge which we just heard about, if nobody agrees about how to do things. Beyond using abbreviations as symbols in formal calculations, in the 14th century, in the end of the 14th century, we also encounter schemes for the addition and multiplication polynomials. Even these seem to go, uh, go, back, uh, go, back, uh, go back to, uh, to the uh, uh, Maghreb models. It emulates a scheme for uh, multiplication this time here. From the later 14th century onward, we also know some scattered instances of the use of several unknowns, which of course is essential in, when we come to Viet and Descartes, who have has a, a, a free range of these. And from the Pacioli, we know that more must have existed, which has gone lost. But even this was never systematized. Pacioli just informs us so that we may know. That is what he says in his commentary of what he shows. The source area inspired the beginning of Abacus algebra must have known, understood the nature of the sequence of algebraic powers as a continual proportion or a geometric series. Uh, that is uh, how the uh, higher, uh, reduced to higher degree uh, equations were, uh, could be solved. That's not strange. That had been described by Al-Karadi uh, uh, around 1000 and has spread from him to Arabic algebra widely. Uh, also, other aspects of early Abacus algebra make one think of a diluted uh, Al Karadi. It's far from certain, however, that the first generation of Abacus algebra writers understood what they were borrowing. If they had the acceptance of false rules, it's hard to explain because then you don't need a control to show that they are false. But in 1344, a Dardy of Pisa showed his formulation of rules for a huge number of cases involving roots of powers that he understood to the full, at least practically. He never explains the principles involved. Maybe he didn't really have a con a con the concept for that. 
That had to uh, wait for Antonio de Mazingi's work half a century later. And although the system shows its first cracks by Antonio, his naming of the higher powers is generally multiplicative. The cube of the cube is the sixth, not the ninth power. That the cube of the cube is the product of the cube and the cube. So the powers, the thing, the second power, the gentle, the cube, uh, uh, etc., are entities, not functions. That must have changed over the next century, but once again, not systematically and not in all writers. Caccioli understood it in uh, 1494. Some writers who understood uh, that the false rules were false tried to find better ways. One method consists in transforming homogeneous equations, for instance, taking a problem about a capital growing over three years from 100 lira to 200 lira. By the, at that moment, the lira was not uh, what it was worth uh, 20 years ago when it uh, disappeared. It was a huge amount. But taking uh, the value of, not taking the value after one year, but the interest per month as the unknown. Mathematical principle, this is a linear transformation, and who did it must have had a very good understanding of polynomial algebra. Uh, the coefficients are not reduced, so we can see how it was done. Whether it was understood by the one who created these rules that they didn't uh, uh, were, uh, a generally valid is not clear, but Dardy knew, I claims, it's not clear whether he knew exactly when they were uh, wrote. And another way to advance consists of the invention of special roots. The cube root of 44 with added five uh, is four because four to the third power equal to 44 plus five, uh, five times four. In itself, this is just a name for the solution to the case cube equal to things and number. Just as we may say the cube root of 27 is nothing but the solution to the equation x, uh, x to the third equal to 27. But around 1400, a treatise shows that it can, uh, uh, it can also be used to solve the case cube and chancy, cube and, uh, uh, and second power equal to number. That is, it can uh, show connections between the different kinds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, equations. Even this is achieved by linear substitution and thus asking for the master polynomial algebra. And if anybody has tried to do that without symbols, they'll understand it is a very good uh, 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 mastery. Neither uh, type of text explain the methods. So the, uh, in consequence, these ingenious methods were not diffused in the environment as far as we can see. So Cardano had to reinvent them. There was no, there was absolutely no import on the German costs the next phase of my story, nor the false rules. They were happily forgotten. They are only repeated by Ben Finance in the 50s because he was isolated in Portugal and, uh, uh, and just copied from Italian books without uh, uh, understanding much. The costs descended from Abacus algebra, but in an intricate and protracted process. Beginning around 1450, a number of German mathematical writers, Friedrich Amann, a monk, and Johannes Regiomontanus, and several anonyms with background in university culture and astronomy took interest in algebra, a new mathematical discipline they wanted to learn about. The first decades of reception mirrors the messy state of the Abacus algebra. So, what uh, if uh, you import from a messy uh, field like algebra uh, of the Abacus tradition, then you have difficulties. Both Amman and Ricky Montanos would use uh, uh, several different sets of abbreviations, evidently corresponding to the source of each moment where they were writing. And some of the anonyms were much more modeled. There's absolutely no reason to be scandalized. What they drew on was equally confused. None of them had the good luck to stumble upon a high level abacus algebra. And before the Germans could produce coherence of their own, they had to make sense of whatever they had been able to find. 
But eclecticism didn't last many decades. In 1489, Johannes Wiedmann, who was university educated and university teacher, published the first large scale Rechenbuch. It contains no algebra, but already three years before, he had held algebra lectures at Leipzig University. That was just the moment when specialized mathematics teachers were beginning to exist in select universities, for instance, Leipzig. Both Aman and Reggio Montanus would use, oh, oh. According to the announcement, uh, uh, Wittmann would explain the 24 rules of algebra and that which they presuppose. And the latter, they, uh, what they presuppose, is specified to include algorithms for fractions. Algorithm was normally uh, 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 calculating the Hindu algebra numerals for fractions, ratios, and thirds. So there's some hint of knowledge of the elementary level of uh, element 10, we can say. Wiedemann built on a manuscript in his possession, which exists today, and which taken as a whole is quite eclectic. There are many different treatises in, uh, in it. But we may suppose that Wiedemann's lectures were in the style of his book and are systematic, which is supported by the announcement. He probably used the standard notation for power that we know from manuscript dating uh, from the following years. And plus and minus were used in his Reckon book. University lectures, of course, were in Latin. And la another Latin algebra from no later than 1504, but likely perhaps uh, five to 10 years earlier, was almost certainly written by Andreas Alexander, who was one of the first specialized mathematics lecturers in Leipzig. Alexander's work didn't circulate much. Uh, it only existed in manuscript. It was used by Adam Ries, partly indirectly, for Adam Ries's cause. It even that work didn't circulate. Uh, it was only Councilman and Wusing who made, made a printed edition uh, not, uh, not so long ago. The only last influence of Alexander's work was inspiration which Christoph Rudolf received from it. But we can see from, uh, from the manuscripts that Alexander may have learned from the higher level of Italian abacus algebra, which he seems to uh, have digested with some approximation. Rudolf in his course from 1528, beyond the eight rules, which uh, came out of 24 by reduction, took over the standard notation for algebraic powers and established it definitively. These notations were the still standard when I discussed it, Descartes had to learn them in the Jesuit school uh, yeah, after uh, uh, 1609. Rudolf also borrowed the schemes for the polynomial arithmetic familiar in Italy at least since 1400. That is, he used this notation as a crude symbolism restricted range, but it, it was symbolic algebra. Rudolf tells that he has learned from Heinrich Schreiber from Vienna University. And Schreiber's or Grammatheus's a new künstlich book from 1521 contains the long algebra section, but it was totally overshadowed by Rudolf's uh, book. Rudolf knew basic university mathematics well. He produced no new mathematical knowledge, but he provided order and structure. Begun what I have already mentioned, he teaches the use of a second unknown, actually more than two unknowns, but he, he uses them in a way that there are never more than two in play at a time, so he can do with two, two names. And while predecessors had simply used two or more unknowns when they did so occasionally without taking much notice of, uh, of what was done, then Rudolf states that this technique is the completion of the cross, indeed in truth, a completion without which it would not be worth much more than a fiffling, a trifle. Rudolf's cross became and remained a defining basis for, uh, for the cross. 
to discipline on German algebra. So in 1553, when Rudolf's book uh, was long out of print and couldn't be found, even at triple price, as Michael Stiefel writes in the preface, Stiefel produced an improved, much augmented edition. But already in 54, Stiefel had published the Arithmetica Integra. Here, Stiefel acknowledges the importance of Rudolf's cost, but he goes much beyond, for instance, dealing in depth with elements 10 transformed into arithmetical theory. Before, as he says, nobody can present today, uh, that is on the condition of arithmetization, uh, elements 10 in Euclid's geometric way. He also invents a letter-based notation for many variables, allowing also higher powers and products of these uh, without using it himself for anything spectacular. He just shows how it can be done. It had little immediate impact, but it may have inspired Jean Borel Goudeau in 1559, who like, like Stiefel makes use of capital letters A, B, C, D. Borel's notation was borrowed with due reference by Guillaume Gousselin, so there we know uh, 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 the, uh, the influence in 1577, and Gosselin may on his part have provided inspiration for Viet's letter symbolism. Some people refer to Ramos, but I think that can be uh, excluded. Ramos' level is so low that a good algebraic uh, author like Gosselin would have nothing to learn from him. In his exposition, uh, uh, like like Viet, Viet, like this, sorry. In his expositions of algebra from 1550 and 51, the first was printed in Basel, the, uh, the second in Paris. Johann Schäuble doesn't advance over Rudolf and Stiefel within algebra proper. He integrates algebra with, uh, into elements one to six, that is the Basel book. But it only means that he inserts numerical examples and innovates even with these only by including radicals and binomials in the range of accepted numbers. Some of the additions of the comparable elements had also uh, inserted such uh, numerical examples, but never with the rationals. And the separately repu uh, republished algebraic introduction from 51, republished 52, so it must have been so, have so well, exhibit humanist aspirations. Firstly, by endorsing the de Montano's description of algebra to Diophantus. And secondly, by including a number of the Greek arithmetical epigrams. Jacques Pelletier tells us in La Gepa from 1554, what was at hand, in, uh, at hand in France at that moment. Pelletier knows Pacioli's Summa and Cardano's Ars Magna, and from Cardano he knows about Fibonacci. He also knows Stiefel and Schäubel, and he has heard about Rudolf, Ries, and Nunes, but not seen their books. So Pelletit himself takes Stiefel as his basis, uses, using all his symbolism, not only, and even borrowing from him some classicizing condiments, in part going back to, uh, to Rudolf through Stiefel. Descartes and whoever else went to a Jesuit school after 1608 encountered algebra in La Fleche and the other Jesuit schools through Christopher Clavius's algebra. And even this is in the style of Rudolf and Stiefel, even though also Clavius uh, believed or pretended to believe that algebra came from Pierre Diophantus. Clavius, a great pedagogue, makes his own formulations, but for instance, his way to deal with negative numbers and negative powers leaves no doubt that he had had the arithmetic and take on his disk while writing uh, uh, his book. To judge from his technical terminology, Viet's primary reference for algebra, not only for the unknowns, was Gosselin, who knows Stiefel, Cardano, and Pelletier. So what Viet experienced as, I quote, an old art defiled and befouled by barbarians, and what Descartes described as 
a confused and obscure art that puts the mind in difficulty instead of a science that cultivates it, was not Arabic algebra, but Abacus algebra transformed and put into order as cos and to some extent as unfolded by Cardano. This putting into order was effectuated by writers like Alexander, Schreiber, Rudolf, Stiefel, and Cardano, not university teachers, all of them, some were, but all strongly influenced by the Boethian Euclidean norms of the university tradition as it has developed since the 13th century. What Viet and Descartes and their ilk knew as interesting mathematics was already different, however. We may speak of it as humanist mathematics, better perhaps post-humanist mathematics. Humanism had always been centered on the civically useful as understood in courtly culture. In 1606, the Chancellor of Florence had asserted that Latin letters were a weapon more to be feared than a troop of horses. So Latin letters were civically useful. Around 1500, however, it had become evident that Latin letters were definitely no match for the French artillery nor did they help much when the Portuguese and Spanish courts engaged in transoceanic travel. This was also the time when Pacioli, summarizing a century's experiences of architects and military and hydraulic engineers, could reinterpret Aristotle's opinion of mathematics as the most certain of scientists and claim, it, uh, claim that Aristotle had said that all the other sciences derived from mathematics. The first is quotes in Latin, the second is his uh, Italian explanation. In consequence of such experience, some humanist or court mathematicians with a humanist bent engage in publishing and translating the Greek mathematical classics. The full edition of Greek Euclid appeared in 1533. Carpos and Apollonius, books from one to four, Archimedes and Diophantus followed over the next four decades. So when Viet reached mathematical maturity, a rather full range of the Greek mathematical classics was within his reach. But this acquisition of new material was relevant for the transformation of algebra, which is my topic, only because the mathematical undertaking itself had changed. The medieval university, when teaching mathematics, had taught theory in lectures, and disputations and questioners invited meta mathematical reflection about the status of the object and about the objects of the theory. That is also what we see in Schäuble's volumes. That's why the algebra doesn't change in geometric the uh, theory, and, uh, and the humanist inclusion of Greek epigrams do not affect the algebra. The metamorphosis of the mathematical undertaking is epitomized in the famous concluding line of Vietzky and Jagovna. Nullum non problema solvera, to leave no problem unsolved. The mathematics of Viet, of his antagonist Ariane van Roman, and later Descartes, Fermat, etc., were centered on problems. Within an agonistic culture, which was exactly what made van Roman the antagonist of Viet. Abacus culture too had been agonistic. The Abacus masters challenged each other with higher degree algebraic problems and with difficult versions of recreation of classics. This led to the invention of special roots and made Benedetto de Firenze create a notation for first degree algebra with up to five unknowns. But nobody appears ever to have noticed Benedetto's innovation before I did so two years ago because it's a huge manuscript. <laughs> Nobody seems to have read all of it. Uh, one reason being at least uh, the exiguous numbers of practitioners who were at a level where they had understand and appreciate it. The German uh, Rechenmeister culture probably had a higher density and being a print culture, it had much more efficient communication. It was not intellectually agonistic, however. Books were competing on the book market 
and were therefore almost invariably marketed on their title page as Neu New. Under these circumstances, the special rules had no social role to play, and they never became part of the cults. The culture of Viet and his kind was agonistic once again, but now its problems were those inspired by Greek geometers. That was what pushed Viet and Descartes to create their very different versions of the new algebra. This new algebra turned out to be the hoped for tool for solving the problems that occupied the new mathematicians, just as Abacus and Rechenmeist algebra had been an efficient tool for solving traditional problems. A generation later, it also provided the soil from which the next level of analysis could grow. Thank you. So we, we uh, a little bit change, change the plan now. So we have now some, some questions and then we, we uh, start with the coffee break now and then have the uh, third talk after the coffee break as we talk back. Yes, but now we have still some time for some. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, thank you, Jens, very much for the talk. I also didn't comment on Steve's talk before because I thought we had sort of a general discussion afterwards. Uh, and I'm now glad that I waited to make this comment after hearing your talk as well. Clearly, you were coming from very different disciplines, but I do think that your talks in a way are complementary. So um, if I may combine my two remarks, I start by commenting briefly on Steve's talk and then on your talk. Uh, yeah, Jens. Uh, so first of all, Steve, you showed us a framework and uh, the many disciplines and authors who contributed it. And I certainly admit two things. This is the framework and you expressed it perfectly in which I also see our work being based. So this is the theoretical and conceptual framework. And I admit that we didn't properly pay tribute to all those who have you know, shaped to this uh, framework. I was, of course, aware of Jack Goody's work, and I, I wasn't aware of Clark's work, and I didn't cite him, so I'm sorry for that, and we'll, we will do in the next edition of the <laughs> Evolution of Knowledge, hopefully, when it comes. Uh, but, you know, I feel very much at home in what you, what you thought, and you were right, you know, that could have been a common basis. Unfortunately, I have to say that most history of science hasn't had uh, such a clear theoretical perspective as you outlined it for uh, anthropology, linguistics. So this cognitive bend wasn't, uh, for me, still surprisingly after all these years, not so much a, a, as a common coin for the history of science, which was uh, in a way theoretically much less ambitious than uh, sort of the, the basic, you called it simple uh, cognitive artifacts that you were dealing with. And I still think there's an enormous potential in applying this vision to the history of science. And I think this becomes very clear from Jens's talk because uh, there is perhaps one dim dimension in, 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 uh, in, in what Steve showed that was you know, a bit short shrifted, which is the developmental aspect. The, uh, how does one get from one cognitive artifact to the next one? How does it really emerge? And you made a short remark where you said, oh, this might be difficult to apply evolutionary thinking to this because hybridization of technology, uh, the loss in small populations and so on. But that's of course exactly the challenge that historians of science confront as, as Jens's talk uh, showed so wonderfully. You know, this you know, complicated lines of transmission, the role of you know, changing symbolisms. Uh, and I think you know, that, is, that shows us this developmental uh, dimension at work in a concrete historical case. And it would, of course, and, and Jens is one of the first to, uh, uh, to be familiar with these you know, larger conceptual frameworks, that these can be really merged. And so you have you know, a wonderful material for cultural theory, and you have a wonderful framework, a, a theoretical framework for such a theory. And there is still an enormous potential to bring them together, which is unexploited in the field of the history of science. And uh, I can only hope that, you know, we are not just looking back, but we're also looking into the future where this potential can really be exhausted. 
So that's the way I see your two talks as complementary, and I thank you both very much for them. I can say that if I had gone into the details of development of simple of schemes, of, uh, uh, of negative numbers, et cetera, uh, and, and the number concept, it would be much more clear that it was connected. I just skipped the, uh, skipped the surface. <laughs> We will convene at 11.15, okay? okay. I also, I think it's so slow.
So welcome back, everyone. We we wait for a certain Mr. Ren. There he is. So from from the brain and the abacus. Now we we dive into a bronze uh, casting. It will be quite a quite a journey, but maybe maybe everything is disconnected. We come to our third speaker, to Professor Liu. She's Professor of Metallurgical History at the Institute of Archaeology, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences in Beijing. And from there, we, we zoom her in today. Her research interests cover the material analysis of metal, the development of metallic technology in early China, especially the bronze casting technology. She received her PhD from the Institute for the History of Natural Sciences, Chinese Academy of Science in 2006, and won Luce Foundation to a visiting scholar at Boston University in 2010 and 2012. She published some of her systematical studies on the casting technology and craft production of bronze in the late Shang Dynasty in her book, Study on the Casting Technology of Bronze Ritual Vessels Excavated from Ying Shu. The floor is yours. Can, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. Now I should start my speech. Yes, please. Okay, let me share the uh, everybody. Uh, I'm very glad to uh, att uh, attend this conference for celebrating the um, <laughs> the birthday of the uh, Professor Jorgen. Happy birthday to you, although it's a little late. Um, my, uh, my speech title is Inheritance and Innovation. Casting technology and the craft production of bronzes in Shang Dynasty. Uh, in 16th BC to 11th BC, 11th century BC, China. Um, my name is Liu Yu. Uh, thanks for the uh, introduce introduction of, of me. When we, when we go to the museum, um, we also can see a lot of bronzes in the museum, uh, such as this one, this is an elephant zun, this is an ding, this is a gong. This to interrupt. Uh, we cannot see your uh, screen. Could you please share again? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. It's um... oh. oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. No problem. Uh, and now it's okay. Yes. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. I I need to go to the first one. I'm a little, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous because I'm not very familiar with the tomb. In China, we use other, uh, other software. Okay, try sharing again. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I just say when we go to the museum, we can see a lot of Chinese bronzes in the museum all over the world. And we can see just like this uh, very lovely uh, animal ship, like uh, elephant. We call it Xiang uh, Zun. It's elephant Zun. I'm sorry, uh, we, we can't see your screen. You are not sharing at the moment. Mm -hmm. You did it before, but then you, you blocked it. Oh, 
okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Ah. Mm, to, mm. It's not share this one. Okay. Okay, it's now. Um, no, it's still blocked. Oh, it's and stop. Eh? It's okay. Oh, uh, it's still it's still stopped. I I'm not know why. Um. Before you, oh, oh. I think um, you need to share the screen and maybe not the PowerPoint. Um, because you did manage before. Um, it's it's blocked now. It's it's showing that you're sharing, but we can't see what it is. Audio um, professor. Um. Oh, don't I'm worry. So sorry. Now it's okay. Oh uh, no! Oh, not not. Uh, I. Hey, why? I why I share this one shift. Oh, uh, I'm still. Okay, um, she did the manage before, right? We, we did see it for a second. I think I can't understand if it's a Yeah. Nope. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, Perfect. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I mm, waste the, uh, the people's time. Yeah, um, when we go to the museum, we can see a lot of Chinese bronze vessels, such, such as this very cute elephant uh, shaped uh, uh, bronze vessels. It's called Xiang Zun. We call it elephant zun, and this is ding. Uh, this is uh, a tripod. And all the, most of those bronzes are come from Shang Dynasty, about, uh, um, about uh, uh, 13, uh, 16th century BC. Um, in China, the almost uh, the early early almost the earliest uh, bronze jue is come from early Tou site is about eighteenth uh, century BC, and uh, we in China all the bronze we all the bronze wares are cast by copper and uh, 
copper and the tin alloy or copper tin lead alloy. This is a little special because in Europe and West Asia, they all use the bronze just uh, uh, copper and the tin. The lead uh, is uh, the, the lead. Uh, there isn't lead in their bronze vessels, bronze vessel and other wares. In China, we use a very special special method to cast our uh, bronze vessels and other wares. Uh, this uh, this method, we call it uh, section mode casting. Uh, we use a model, then type some, some, some piece of clay to, to make the mold. Then make a core to be the, the to, uh, uh, and make the core. They together we got an uh, assembly, an assembly. Then we cast, pour the bronze liquids to the assembly. Then we got the bronze wares. This method is so special. is uh, is just uh, different from other civilization just like uh, um, just like uh, they use uh, lost wax casting to make a stature and uh, uh, and the other things all they use forging to 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 make the weapons and uh, tools and the other things um, using section mode casting technology to make bronze ritual vessels is the uh, uh, most important uh, characteristic features in Chinese bronze age. I can just give a brief uh, description of China's early period, um, we we should. Uh, I will use the this three city, uh, this four city. The first one is we call it Early uh, Tou. We call it Early Tou. Uh, the early to site, I'm um, sorry. The early to site is in the Yanshi city, Henan province, this one. Um, it's about uh, the, the, fir the first uh, period of the bronze bronzes use. Then in Yanshi city also has a Yanshi Shangcheng site. It's, it's early Shang about. This is Zhengzhou city. Zhengzhou city is also in Henan province. There is Zhengzhou Shangcheng site. It's only also early Shang, uh, and it's the capital city of the early Shang. This is a very important inner city. It's not the capital city, but uh, uh, in early Shang and the middle Shang, uh, the city is the city is uh, found a lot of bronze vessels. And uh, this one is, we will talk about the 
uh, in this speech is uh, is major uh, major of this uh, research is in Yinxu. Yinxu is the capital city of the uh, late. Middle Shang and Late Shang. Middle Shang site named the Huanbei Shangcheng site. I will give you the map. Um, and the Late Shang's capital city is called Yinxu. And uh, we, we will talk all the um, bronze vessels from this, uh, from, from this sites above. This development of mode casting technology from all the Shang period, we can see the development and the evolution path. You can see this thing from Panlongcheng site is early Shang period. And this thing is from Yinxu, Huayuan Zhuang M11, Five, it's middle Shang period, and this thing is for, from Yinxu, it uh, in the late Shang period. We can see the difference. This one, they are the 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 foot is hollow, and uh, this its ear is in the line with one foot. A year is with one foot. It's not symmetrical. Um, and uh, when they use it, because they want to, uh, they want to make a uh, cast uh, Period, a uh, custom method is more easier. And uh, to middle shang, they they want to they want to the the foot is not hollowed. They will they will the 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 bottom of the thing is flight and uh, they they tend to uh, symmetrical and in the next step is late shang things the assembly is mode uh, we can see they have a more bottom mode and this this mode section assembly is more comp complex city. We can see this is a simple thing. And uh, we can see they use three section mode and just one core. But this one is uh, uh, the most uh, complexity uh, section mode. We can see they use also three modes, but they use two. They use two core, so the the thing's foot is not hollow. This this. This core is for the foot core. is is also called blind core. After after poured, they will stay in the stay in this, and the, and the, they make the bottom is flat. This one is the uh, is the mode of the the foot. So we 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 found this uh, this clay clay core in the foundry site. 
in Anyang. We call Yixu is a very, very uh, famous, famous site in China, almost uh, the most famous site. It uh, was World Cultural Heritage. There is a lot of bronze vessels. Uh, this is, we call it Simu Wudi. It's the largest uh, and the heaviest uh, bronze uh, vessels in pre uh, in in China Chinese Bronze Age, and they also found a lot of auricle bone. It's the most uh, ancient uh, word of uh, of uh, in China. This is. We call it Huanbei Shangcheng. Uh, this site is uh, a capital city, ca capital city of Middle Shang. This is Yinxu site, um, a city of the, the the capital city of the late Shang. It's a very big site, over an area of about twenty five square kilometers and uh, it has very big uh, roads and uh, it has a uh, um, drainage system to uh, to 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 make the water uh, the waste water can um, can 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 go out from the city. And we can call the very, very big cemetery of the king. This is a people, uh, a man, and uh, they have a very, very long way road. Long way road. And this is the uh, excavation of the auricle bone. A lot of oracle bone, just like ancient book. Uh, we we can know the we can know uh, what the the king they do. And this all the old uh, photos in the um, nineteen uh, thirty to. 1940s. In Anyang, there is a lot of workshops, all kinds of. Uh, this is bronze foundry, we can see. And uh, this is uh, bone workshop like this, and uh, jade workshop. And uh, all the workshops, they almost uh, make uh, stay together. So they just uh, have, uh, just uh, um, to be some places we can call it uh, workshop destruction or workshop um, place. This is a pottery site. Pottery sites. Uh, um, this is a pottery kings at Liu Jiazhuang North. This is just a location. This has some specialization uh, production because they just uh, uh, produce the same one, same kind of, uh, just uh, two kinds of. This is called the dough, it's called the uh, guan they have some specialization uh, production. And this is very, very big workshop at Tiesanlu to make a bone workshop. They, they cut the bone and to make the uh, 
make some make some uh, bone production to to use just like uh, just like uh, a needle to to in uh, in people's hair. This foundry workshop in Xiaomingtun is a very big one. We can see this the uh, excavation site. Uh, we can see they found a lot of that, a lot of mold, and a lot of uh, this is core, and this is the uh, bottom mold. We can see that uh, sites and uh, the foundry remains and analysis them to, to know how the foundry workshop worked. Um, this is a very famous paper in 1935 by Kaubach. Uh, he collected a lot of uh, uh, clay mold like this one in his books and uh, th this clay molds all in the Museum of Feist Antiquities, Sweden. Um, it's very famous. And we found all the, all the molds they come from this site. So it's very interesting. There is some relationship between our excavation and the fund and, and the museum, museum's collection. And uh, use all the things we can, we can uh, reproduction of the man, manufacturing process. We can use clay material preparing. Uh, this one, all the, all the green, all the green, we can know the details of the production to make, uh, how to make the uh, clay mold assembly. And uh, this one is how to make the, uh, this red one is how to make the bronze, uh, how to make the, the metal, how to make the alloy. And uh, put them together to get the bronzes. And we can do some post casting, uh, post casting work. All these things is not all these things. Mining and the smelting of the copper tin is. Uh, not uh, exist in the capital of the Shang Dynasty. They all use they all use the They do all the things in other sites because, uh, for example, they use it in um, Jiangxi province or Anhui province or Hubei province, and then they transport it to Anyang. Um, in Anyang, just do the copper melting and the alloying, uh, use copper and the tin. Use clay material preparing. We can see 
use the barrier loess soil. Then we do some model like this one. Then, then we use this special material to make uh, molds. Molds is use the um, use the clay to copy on it and then take it to be the to be the mold. And we can see the the motif. The motif is just uh, uh, just made is just made on the mold uh, on the model, then copy it to the mold. This is a uh, ingot, copper ingot found in Anyang. This is the uh, lead ingot found in Anyang, but we cannot uh, find uh, tin ingot. We just found uh, these two uh, raw materials in Anyang. And the use, this is a, uh, this is a, uh, piece, piece uh, a, a small piece of the um, furnace. Use the furnace to make them together to get the, um, to get the, to get the alloy. Then maybe we can use some pouring uh, pass, but this just uh, uh, used uh, uh, for big, big uh, bronze vessels, not for small vessels. Small vessels we can just uh, use uh, small, um, small instrument to take uh, to take the bronze into the. Uh, into the assembly, then we got the, uh, then we got the, then we got the, uh, the bronze vessels just like the. So we we can do we can know some conclusion. This production process was controlled by organized the management and the complex production process implicates that bronze casting is a co-craft which combines two technological system, pottery making and metal melting. The choice of clay mold casting technology of Shang bronzes could be related to the loyal soil in the central plain of China and benefited from the outstanding pottery making technique in late Neolithic, Neolithic time. This research is sponsored by the project, the creation and spread of scientific knowledge organized by the Institute for History of Natural Sciences. Chinese Academy of Sciences. Thanks to my director, Professor Hua Juming and Professor Zhang Baichun. Thanks to my co-author, Professor Yue Zhangwei. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We uh, have now learned that um, Professor Svend Hansen uh, won't moderate the, the final discussion. So this gives us more time to, to discuss about the contributions. And I think we hereby start with the direct questions to the contribution by Professor Yu. So, but please be aware that you need to speak into the microphone. Yes. Um, this is uh, Stephen Levinson speaking. I'm not sure if you can see me, but um, I just uh, I'm going to ask you some questions uh, from a uh, point of view of a practical bronze caster. 
since I, I do it. Um, but I, I wanted to just correct a couple of, of points about European um, casting. So um, lead does occur in a great deal of um, European bronze uh, alloys. Uh, I'm not sure it's serendipitous or you know accidental, but it's there and it also in classical uh, uh, bronzes. Also, stone molds are found in European Bronze Age uh, sites. So, uh, so that was a piece molding system. And, and of course, uh, sand casting uh, is very predominant. Uh, it's actually now the main method <laughs> of uh, casting um, non-ferric uh, alloys. So, uh, and that's also done on a piece molding uh, basis. Um, uh, but uh, but the, my questions were these, really. So you didn't. I, I'm just. I'm curious about a couple of sort of technical issues. So, uh, so the you didn't. The, the diagrams you showed don't show us which way up the uh, mold was. So and it doesn't show a pouring cup. I mean, a pouring cup is essential because you need the weight to push the metal down into the details of the of the pattern. Um, so I would just be interested in that. Another issue is, is the venting. So a major problem with, with bronze casting is the gases that are involved. So the traditional Roman method um, is problematic for that, but sand casting uh, and the modern ceramic shell casting, the, the, the gases escape through the actual mold. Um, now, what if you do, so this, if therefore it's sort of an interesting technical question actually what the Chinese molds, uh, to what extent they were vitrified, to what extent they, what, what temperature they were baked, um, be, uh, because they don't seem to have the kind of venting that you would need like in the European um, uh, lost wax uh, system. So, so that, that, those are, I think, uh, my questions. Uh, uh, professor, you want to know the temperature? You you know yeah. want to know the pouring temperature? Oh, but, oh, oh what no, the, the mold itself was it pre-fired? Presumably it was pre-fired before pouring. Oh, pre-fired. Yes, yes. Uh, oh, um, uh, yes, yes. Uh, we uh, we 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 pre pre-fired. Yes. Prefired because uh, you, you can, you know, it's uh, can make the gas and uh, uh, gas out and uh, other things is all, all good for the casting. Yes. But the question yes. is what temperature then? Because, because presumably it was low fired at about maybe 700 or 800 degrees and not higher, because otherwise you would have too much vitrification, I think, for it to work effectively. For the gases to escape. Anyway, that's a, just a technical issue that I think uh, you might in, want to. In China, our clay mold is just a, a very uh, small fire. You, you can you can see it's very low temperature of this. It's just like clay, but not clay. Uh, the um, the micro uh, uh, structure uh, from uh, SEM, we can see the they have a, a lot of um, holes and it's uh, just like uh, just like a, a small sandy. Yeah, you know, it looks like sand mode, not clay mode. Yeah, I see. So that is actually very similar to European sand casting uh, then. Yes, in, in yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, interesting. Thank you. Next question. Jürgen. Thank you for this Im impressive talk and this impressive work. I have a question. It, uh, it, I was very impressed by your reconstruction of the production process because it points to uh, a high level of uh, distribution of labor. You know, so it seems that the processes were in parallel and many people worked at it. And the question is, uh, was this partly due to the number of products that came out? Was, was this a large scale operation with the aim of producing 
many things or was this more because of the technical issues that you had such a high uh, complexity of the production process so what what drives the complexity is it the technical level or is it the number of products and then of course the question is how stable is this configuration the social configuration that you need to do this mm. Thank you, for, uh, thank you for the very good uh, question. Uh, the complexity for, uh, uh, at first, uh, is the complexity of the technology, because uh, you can see it's uh, a, long, a, long, a lot of details about the, um, about the, uh, the production. Uh, for example, use the, they must uh, uh, prepare the material, use water to wash it, to make the clay out, then uh, use, uh, uh, then, then, then add some additives to make the material can have a good, um, uh, can have a good casting, um, <laughs> function, yeah, uh, and uh, uh, then they make uh, the model, then they make the mode, then they put it together, and uh, other things is the uh, some some workers they must uh, to do the 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 metal, they must uh, um, to melting, to melting the 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 copper and make a copper and a tin to uh, to put together to the uh, alloy. So uh, and we all know a lot of material come from very uh, far away place. So that that uh, means the government of Shangqing they have a lot of powerful control of the, uh, the long distance control. Long distance, distance control, that, that a lot of, um, uh, I, I mean the king, they have a very power, they are uh, the, the, the Shang King, he is very powerful to control the raw materials such as uh, copper tin and other things. And uh, make this uh, work is a very complex city work. Uh, um, um, Professor Hua, uh, Hua Juming, uh, he wrote a paper to guess, to cast the Simu Wu Di. That's uh, uh, the biggest uh, uh, vessel. Need uh, about uh, over um, eight hundred people to do uh, several months to do one thing. So I think it must need uh, uh, some uh, management and uh, uh, the powerful control. They can do the things. In China, we found uh, almost uh, over 2,000 uh, uh, bronze vessels in Anyang. Um, it's just in Anyang, our excavation. <clears throat> but uh, after <clears throat> Anyang, in all the world's museum, we can see a lot of Shang bronze vessels. So we can know there is a large scale of the uh, production. So I think it's very complexity, just uh, as technical and uh, just uh, just for the uh, social. Yeah, in uh, it's all all com complexity. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The next question is directly behind you, Jürgen. Behind you.
Yes, thank you very much. You showed us a very impressive picture of the technological complexity of combining two different technologies, metal mining and melting and, and clay working on the other hand. Now, this Bronx production was only really actively pursued during a certain time in Chinese history during the Shang and Zhou periods. And then it essentially disappeared and it was only later revived. Uh, interest was only revived in the Sum period, but for historical reasons. Now, it uh, obviously depended on a complex system of technological knowledge and this knowledge needed to be preserved and taught to new generations. And so we must have, we must see some schemes, how this worked. And then the question is whether it was just a knowledge that was created in the beginning and then essentially kept, or do you also see technological innovations in the process from the Shang to the Zhou period? And later when the technology was abandoned and disappeared, which part of the technology, the metal handling part or the clay production part was the part that was abandoned and became forgotten first? Uh, thank you for your very, uh, very, <laughs> uh, very uh, good question. I think uh, the clay mode casting is a traditional casting technology in China. We, we, uh, we not only used in the Bronx, but also in the iron, you know. Uh, it, we, we use the um, casting iron is different from other, other countries because we have very, <clears throat> we have a, a traditional for the uh, section mode casting. And uh, uh, they, they still existed for the <coughs> uh, for other uh, for uh, influence others other method such as we call it uh, um, uh, sand sand mode you know sand mode and uh, lost wax is uh, after <coughs> After Bronze Age, we use other uh, method, but the sand, uh, the the sand mode is very like the clay mode. It's just uh, uh, the potent of the sand to uh, high higher than uh, than the clay mode, but uh, the material preparation is very very similar. Uh, so I think uh, the traditional is not very dis is not disappeared. It's just uh, like uh, use uh, it is uh, uh, developed and uh, to uh, to to uh, there is some change 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 to other method in in Song Dynasty. They want to copy the ancient time, but it's use method is different. They use lost wax method. So it looks very different from the, uh, the ancient, uh, ancient bronze vessels. I think uh, the inheritance and uh, innovation is the, is the major character of China metallurgy uh, history. Because uh, for example, uh, maybe we learned uh, the um, metallurgy uh, of bronze from uh, East Asia or other things, but we do our very a special system of section mode casting. And, and uh, the, uh, the iron is also the same one. We, uh, we started from the East Asia, but we do a very special Chinese iron use casting method uh, to make. So um, I, 
uh, I think it's um, not disappeared, it's just a change. Are you? Uh, Thank you. Thank you for the professor. I hope I, I, I understand your meaning and give you my uh, answer. It was a switch from Bronx to iron technology then later. Mm. So actually, I have, a, I have another question, which is due to my ignorance, uh, so I have to say. So I've, I've seen that some of these vessels had uh, three legs and some other four legs. Is there a reason? Three legs. Uh, three legs you know, where they... Yeah, yeah. Some, some of them have three legs, some other have four legs. And is there any reason uh, beyond aesthetics? Because three legs is much more stable than four legs. So was that, I mean, it was the aesthetic or practical reason why there were some of them, or for example, the older, well, with three legs, the uh, younger with four legs? Uh, yes, <laughs> three legs tripod, like a three legs thing is a very, uh, you know, uh, to, to make a round, uh, round type, uh, round shaped uh, um, vessels is more uh, easier. Is easier than <laughs> much much more easier than the uh, square one. Square one is uh, uh, a little later than the uh, four legs square one is a little later than the um, three legs one, because I think uh, the. In, in China, there are two, uh, two reasons. Just the, uh, one reason is uh, thinking. They think the square one is much uh, honorable than, much more honorable than the round one. The square one is uh, uh, the square thing and the other square uh, things, they all found in the high level tombs. Uh, and the, the round one is much more common. Uh, this is the first uh, thing. The other thing, the technical, uh, the the technical reason, is the squares. The square thing is, uh, um, um, I think it's some a little about the stress, so it's difficult to cast uh, than, the, than the three legs. For example, in early Shang period, we have the uh, earliest uh, square, square D. They use just uh, like uh, several pori to make the, the add together. They cannot do it just use one pori. A, it needs um, several times casting to adhere every, every part of to make together. So I think uh, uh, two reasons. Okay, thank you. There's another question by Steve. Had a very small comment about the thread, uh, about, the, about why the loss of the uh, or the stopping, anyway, why, why the tradition came to an end. One important factor of uh, um, bronze is, is the tin content, and tin ores are quite hard to find, and they're usually not found where copper ores are found. So they usually come from completely different places. And, and that's why uh, during the, the Western Bronze Age, in the Western Europe Bronze Age, uh, there was huge trade networks uh, spread up, uh, when iron took over, all those trade networks collapsed because iron ore is everywhere. So, so the, the rarity of tin ore might have to do with, so the collapse of the technology might have to do with just the uh, absence of control or the absence of networks at a later time. So trade collapse would, uh, would be one reason. 
I think so, because we cannot find uh, a lot of uh, uh, proof. Uh, we know the tin goat in, in Europe, we, we, we found the, the, uh, the, the proof, but in China, <laughs> we cannot find. We cannot, uh, we haven't found. So I think you, you see uh, that reason. It maybe is a um, possible reason. Yeah, thank you. Other, other questions? If not, then we, are there, Maybe some 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 concluding announcements. Yeah, then I maybe to to finish this this uh, session. Then I want to thank all the all the speakers and the, and the audience from mathematics to topology in sand and and bronze was was quite a big step, but. This uh, is a step how uh, knowledge evolved. And I now hand over to some more uh, practical announcements. Yeah, you, you just uh, have to pick up your uh, lunch ticket from uh, Lina. And the lunch is in the ICTP restaurant. You have to walk uh, to the right, and then there is a stair, and you, you will find your way to the building. Uh, Leonardo building where the ICTP restaurant is uh, located. Unfortunately, it is not for you, you, it will be too far to reach the restaurant, but okay. Thank you for your talk. Uh, and uh, we resume at two, we resume at 2 p.m. And I remind everybody that uh, tonight you are invited uh, at a concert at the castle. So you, you have all the information in. In, uh, in your bag. Uh, uh, you, we will uh, move, uh, so for those who want to go back to the hotel, uh, you, there will be time. For those who want to stay here and spend some time in the campus, uh, it's a walk distance from here, so. Uh, please. So, so we are we are now uh, going to 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 lunch now here, and we 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 want to thank you, Osho. She's on the phone already. Bye. <laughs>